are beginning a new series. I am so excited about this series. I'm looking forward to it. I love the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of the, one of the greatest books in the Bible. Of course, all, they're all great, but Daniel is one of my heroes of the faith. And it, Daniel has a lot to say about what you and I are facing today. And so we're going to be looking at today, really relevant to what we're dealing with. And basically, living godly in an ungodly age. How many people can understand what that's, what that's going on with that in our culture today? Isn't it seen that way? That our culture is going uh, the opposite direction at record speed. Uh, you know, what used to be, uh, this used to be a Christianized nation, which means even if you didn't believe in God, when you said the Bible, people listened. And, and I would say between the church and the morality, at least, the church and, and society was pretty close. We had some glaring errors in the area of racism and things of that nature. That I understand we've gotten better. But in the area of marriage and family and morality, we've gone the opposite direction. So as we've made some good progress, we've had a lot of digression in our society today. And what's happened now, we see the world and the church totally going apart. And you can't no longer, it's very difficult to swim in the same water anymore because it's so different. And so the book of Daniel, we're going to deal with very similar about the book of Daniel. Let me just tell you a little bit about the book of Daniel. The Bible is, is, not, is like a library. It's written in different ways. And we're going to look about how Daniel handled the opposition in his world and how he did it respectfully and with strength and in grace and in the anointing of God. Now, just a little history. The Bible is written uh, not chronologically, but is written, for example, you have history books. You have the first... Five books of the Old Testament, you have, the, you have history, you have law, you have po- poetry, and then you get into the, the main, minor pro- major prophets and minor prophets. The major prophets are longer, while the minor par- prophets are shorter in length. And so Daniel is one of the last, chronologically in the Bible, you have this about 600 uh, B.C. is when he comes, and he pre- and 600 B.C. before Christ comes, and right after Daniel's time, then comes Nehemiah. And then we get into the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. So this is towards the tail end of the captivity of the Israelites. Just to kind of help you bring a little more clarity, what happened was the Israelites got their own land, they set up their own kingdom, but God warned them, listen, if you continue to do what you're doing, the world's going to get a hold of you, and my blessing will dissipate and will not be there anymore. And so what happened was they began to to move away from God with the kings. First they had David, then they had Solomon. Solomon really went off the rails and it became a divided kingdom. And then eventually they they fell under Babylonian captivity. Babylon came with Nebuchadnezzar who was a world leader in the modern day Iraq today. He sacked the entire town. He he took all the spoils and took all the wisest and the brightest and the best that Israel had to have and took it with him back to Babylon and left Israel, Jerusalem in destitute. Just the poor, just the people that could not handle themselves, he took the best and the spoils. And so Daniel is in captivity. There's a 70 year captivity before they send their first people back. So think about this, the glory years are gone. The promises are gone. Everything you dreamed of and hoped of and what you had, the high position, you were the head and not the tail, now you are a slave. Now you are a servant. Now you have a hostile culture that's trying to warp you into its own image. And this is basically what Daniel is all about. It's 12 12 chapters long. The first six, six chapters is historical, which talks about what happened. The second six chapters deal with prophetic um, what's going to happen at the end of the age. Eschatology, it's a study of the end of the age. So we're going to be looking about how do you handle to live in a violent and a contrary culture, and we're also going to see what the Bible says about the last days. And it's amazing the things that he predicted by the power of God that we see coming to pass today. It's absolutely astounding. There's so much more I could tell you about Daniel, but let's get right into our, our topic for today. So that's what's happened. How do you live during a difficult time? So let's go ahead, we're gonna open our Bibles. And by the way, if you have your notes, there's some notes inside your bulletin. Uh, if you want to just pick, pick those out, we'll help you a little bit. I couldn't put all the notes on here, but a lot of them are here. If you want some more notes, just raise your hand. We'll have one of the usher or usherettes take care of you for you. Okay, let's move right into it today. Now, this is the, the Daniel chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Jokerinkim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Joker him, I call him a joker, king of Judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. I mean, this is the richest and incredible vessels. Took all the best, all the greatest things of Jerusalem, of Israel, were taken into Nebuchadnezzar's treasury. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels of the treasury of his God. I mean, all the incredible, beautiful, and sacred objects now were in an enemy's hand with a false god. I mean, they are just, have you ever gone through that where everything you ever had, all the hope that you had, the marriage that you used to have, the job you used to have, the, the holiness you used to have, just fell flat, and now you're in captivity. You feel like you are now a second-class or third-class citizen, and this is what they went through. Then the king commanded Aspernes, we we'll just call him Ash, make it a little easier, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family of the nobility and the youths, <laughs> youths without blemish, kind of like me. You don't have to laugh so hard. Of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom. They took the cream of the crop and took the young men, anywhere from probably 12 to 16, 17 years old. These were young men that were very wise and had showed great aptitude. And you know what they also did? The chief eunuch, you know what he did? I know this is a little bit, uh, a lot of scholars would agree with me on this, but uh, you know what a eunuch is? Okay, you, you get your dog fixed. Well. Uh, they fixed the young men. In other words, they castrated them. So think about that for a moment. Humiliated, taken out of your own land and castrated. It's horrible what they did. So the chief eunuch, what happens next? They endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So in other words, I, we're gonna, you're going to erase all the, the stuff you grew up with. We're going to teach you. We're going to indoctrinate you with our philosophy, with our education, with our entertainment, with our morality. We're going to take, we castrated who you are, and we're going to install in you what we say you're supposed to be. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that, but do you see what the world's trying to do to the church today? They're trying to castrate the church and say, hey, you're going to just... You're going to submit to us. Don't you dare stand up. Don't you dare come against us. You have to do what we say. You had your chance. You had your day in the sun. Now you need to do what we say. This is kind of what was going on. How do you handle that, everybody? How do you handle when society gets so violent against you? We have some folks in our church from Iran where people are killed, and, and, and they, they're refugees. And so they're experiencing very much what was going on in the Iraq culture, which was Babylon back in those days. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and the wine he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Well, we're going to get you indoctrinated. You're going to forget what you were, and you're going you're to serve the king. That's what they say. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah from the tribe of Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. These were the four young men that were extraordinary. And they were kind of picked about. These guys are amazing. And they want to serve for the king. Now, when culture shifts, will you shift? Will I shift? What happens when culture says, nope, we're not going to allow that around here anymore. You've got to do what we say. What do you do? Do you throw a temper tantrum? Do you get angry? Do you go, ah! what do you do? What do you do? And I, 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 would, I would suggest to you for a moment that getting angry and getting red in the face and yelling and acting, acting unbecoming is, is counterproductive. And so we're going to see how Daniel and his friends deal with it. But let's just look at what society tries to do to us today. You know, people say, you know, it doesn't really bother me anymore. It doesn't really bother me anymore. Eh, you know, that's fine. You know, abortion doesn't bother me anymore. Just let it go. I know it's bad. It doesn't bother me, all the violence. And you know, I had even people tell me, you know, listen, I don't see what the big deal is about playing these video games. And listen, I'm not here to tell you do's and don'ts. I'll lead up to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, when, when you, I talked to someone not too long ago, and, and they're, you know, they're sitting there, 
and they're blowing people's heads off. And it's graphic, folks. I mean, it's like you get it in your scope and you see it, and it's like really graphic. And I try to I tell my friends, I said, listen, listen, listen to me for a moment. Do you realize video games were designed by the military to take the fear out of the soldiers? The soldiers couldn't pull the trigger. So they had to desensitize them through video type of games. This is what it happens to you. It doesn't really bother me, though. It doesn't really bother me. Or, or I feel like it's no big deal. And so what has happened is we have a society today that it's all based upon how you feel. There's no truth. There's no absolute truth. It's all relative based upon what you deem to be true. Have you noticed that, everybody? Have you noticed it's all about what you feel? Well, I feel this. I feel, you know, there is truth. There's real truth and there's false truth. And I, I understand sometimes people get kind of, kind of carried away with this. You know, I grew up in a culture, not my parents, but I grew up in a culture, part of the, uh, the church heritage we had. They didn't believe in dancing. Don't you shake your booty to that secular music. I can't dance, so it's never been a temptation for me. I'm terrible. I'm a robotic. Throw some music on, Sandra's like, I mean, it's like she's got it in her blood. I'm like, you're so good, honey. And, you know, don't, don't watch her during worship. Anyhow, but she's fantastic at dancing. I'm terrible. At our wedding, it was like, I was like a robot. So it's not a problem for me. But dancing was a big deal. But in the churches I went to growing up, you know what they used to think? That they were against premarital sex. You know why? It might lead to dancing. So when culture shifts, it doesn't bother me. I don't feel it's any big deal. Culture changes, but God does not change. Truth is always truth, no matter what you say. The law of gravity is the law of gravity, right? Thank you. <laughs> Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by when no means will pass away. And so, and this is what happens. The chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Okay, gave them names. He's going to change their name. And do we not see that today? They're trying to change our names. Our identity is being changed. Hey, you shut up and sit down. Hey, you need to listen to what we're saying, right? Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Uh, Mishael he called uh, Meshach. And Azrael he called Abednego. Or Meshach, Hirshach, and the, and the bungalow. The first culture of, the first goal of the culture and the enemy, if you will, is this. They will try to rename you. They want to redefine who you are. The biggest enemy in our lives is the enemy. And what he wants to do is rename you. He wants to tell you something different. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Conversely, the enemy goes, you shall know a lie and it shall hold you in bondage. So the enemy understands this, the great power of Jesus' name, that the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead resides in you, and you can, you can access that resurrection power through the Holy Spirit to change your life step by step, as we mentioned last week in Easter. But the enemy does not want to do that. He wants to tell you, no, 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 no. You, 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 you know, your past, you know, you, you're on your eighth marriage now, or you had that, you, you were involved with this or the other. You can never do that. This is just your orientation. You're just the kind of person. You're, you're just a sad person. You're a depressed person. That's just the way you are, right? They will try to rename you. And instead of calling you who you are, they try to rename you. And so the enemy wants to redefine your identity, opposite of what God has for you. He really wants to redefine your identity. If he can get you to believe a lie, that's, that's the power, folks. The biggest spiritual warfare that you and I face are not demons and angels and all that. That's all fun and it makes nice fodder. It's cool to talk about and it's true. But the biggest battle you and I have, Joyce Meyer has it right, the battlefield of the mind between your two ears is where the enemy, if he can get you to believe a lie, and accept the lie. And if, he, if you'll let the enemy rename you. And so really, our, the job of Cornerstone Church is to help you come to know God. Right? Find freedom by knowing what you, who you are in Christ. Discover the purpose why you're alive. And to make a difference. The enemy's job is to what? That you would not know God. That you would find bondage. You would not find your purpose. And you would make the wor world a worse place. So the purpose of Cornerstone is the opposite of that. So they will try to rename you. So you know what Daniel equals? His original name equals this. 
God is my judge. In other words, God is righteous. God is powerful. God is my judge. I live for God. Do you know what they renamed him? To Belteshar. You know what it means? Lady. Protected the, protected the, protect the king. Lady. Now, why don't you sink, let that sink in for a moment? Calling him a lady. Do you see that happening today? I do. You're, you don't, this con, gender confusion. It's, a tra, it's an attack of the enemy. We're celebrating it, saying it's okay. Listen, we love those people. They need help. But that's what they would try to tell, tell you. Hey, you know, God's my judge, so you're just a, you're castrated now, Daniel, and you're just gonna, you're a lady to protect the king. Focus changes from God to man. Instead of God being my judge, hey, protect the king. You're just a wimp. Protect the culture. And God would say, no, I am the judge, not the culture, not you. And we got to be careful about this, because this is something that happened in the book of Daniel. And then we have Hananiah, which means Yahweh has been gracious. Change to what? Shadrach equals I am fearful of God. God would, God would say to us what? That you, God doesn't want you afraid of him. He wants you to respect him but not be afraid. You know what fear does? Fear drives you away from God and fear leads you to religion. You know what religion is? A bunch of systems that try to please God. While God calls you to a relationship, fear makes you run to religion and mechanisms to try to please God. And this is, the, this is the wretched thing the enemy would do. And so focus is from God is good to God is bad. God's out for your destruction. God is upset with you. If God had his way with you, he'd wipe you out. And people walk around. They're afraid that God is going to throw a lightning bolt on them. But nothing could be further from the truth. God loves you. If you are alive, there's redemption waiting for you. He wants all men and women to find freedom through salvation. Michelle says this, who is what God is? In other words, God is good. God, who's like God? He's incredible. Okay, that's the meaning. Look what they change it to. Meshach, I am despised, contemptible, and humiliated. In other words, hey, you're, you're, you're trash. Just be quiet. Put your head down and suck it up because we're in charge right now. Now, I, listen, I'm an American citizen like everyone else is. I'm part of the we, you are part of the we are the people too. And so we have rights as U.S. citizens that we should start standing up for our rights, not in an angry and belligerent way, but with, with but being, you're going to see through the book of Daniel, with power, with strength, not resorting to the enemy's tactics. But we are the people. We have a right as U.S. citizens sit down. No, I'm not going to sit down. This is wrong. You do it with respect and dignity. The apostle Paul said, hey, listen, I'm a Roman citizen. You cannot treat me this way. I appeal to Caesar. So there comes a time, my friends, where we have to utilize the, the things that God has given us. He's given us a land of representative government. He's given us a land where we can have representative form of government. We can vote. We can get involved with politics. We can do it, make a difference. Now, don't look to politicians as your savior because God knows they're far from that. All sides. But do not let them be wimping you out. You're not despisable. You are bought with a price. You are beautiful in God's eyes. You know what the Bible says? Focus from confidence to cowardness. It's time for the church to stand up, not be angry. I, I, see what happened in the past? They're going to go to hell. You know, all that kind of, and that's what they think we're about, you know? And, and we're enjoying it. You're like, I can't wait to go to hell, you know? And, and that's not what we want to see. And I, I, I even one time was in, was in a service one time and the pastor was preaching and he was saying, and, the, and all those sinners, they're gonna, they're gonna go to hell. And he goes, amen. Which basically is like, damn it, yes. Whoa, did I say that? Yes, I did say that. That's not a kind of person that God wants us to say. To be hoping for someone's damnation. That amen was no amen. 
It was a swear word saying, yes, let them go to hell. My friends, if not by God's grace, we would all be there. All right? So I'm just, I'm just speaking straight with you today. This is what's been happening. So we've gone from one side of being ridiculous to the other side of being cowards. No, let's walk up. Daniel shows us the way, and so are his friends. And Azrael equals Yahweh has helped. And what do they change it to? As a close relationship. What do they change it to? Servant of Nebro. Abednego, servant of Nebo. In other words, you are a servant of a false god. You are a slave. You have no rights. And what happens with this whole area, it changes your view of God from son to slave. When culture shifts, you need to know who you are. We need to know who we are. And I'll tell you a couple things about this. The two most important ways you think, this is really important. The two most important ways you think. Nothing else is more important than these two thoughts. How you think in these next two things is the most important thing you can humanly think of. You know what they are? What you think about God. If you think wrong about God, if you think he's out to get you, you think God's a judgmental God, you think God doesn't love you, no. You need to think God is a good God. God's a powerful God. Don't mess with God. We need to respect God, not be afraid of him, but respect him, have fear of him. Like, like someone who, who surfs in, the, in, the, in Hawaii in his huge waves, they, they have a fear of the ocean, which allows them to surf. A, a, a captain or a, uh, someone in a vessel of a, of a boat, you better have a fear of the ocean if you're a captain of a ship. But you can still love the ocean. You see the difference, everybody? So what you think about God is extremely important, and we have the wrong concept of who God is. He's either some angry person in heaven, or he's some senile old man who teaches old-fashioned. He's more than that. He's fierce. He's, he's powerful. His wrath is incredibly strong, yet he's incredibly gracious, powerful, and loving. I'm going to stop here for a moment, and I'm going to go off what I originally planned, because I did think I need to say this. There was a time in my life when I was uh, about six years old. My parents were going through a, uh, almost divorce, basically. I didn't know what was going on. It was bad. And I started getting fights in school. I started punching people out. <laughs> and, yeah. And so they threw, took me out of the school. They thought something was wrong with me. I was behavioral problems and this thing. But meanwhile, I was just acting out. And uh, they brought me to this school, this, this Christian school called South Shore Christian School in Long Island, New York. No, Long Island, yeah, Long Island, New York, and uh, Smithtown, actually. And, uh, and what happened was um, th they were going to put me in this Christian school. And I was acting up. And so they brought me to the principal's office, a guy named Reverend Herb. Now, does that sound, that sounds, you're going to see Reverend Herb, the principal. And this guy might as well have been God. I mean, he was like six foot, 800 pounds. <laughs> I mean, he had this woolly white hair, and he had these piercing blue eyes. Thank you. <laughs> that sounds ominous. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Can you come next service, too? That really, that really helped my point. Uh, so... Anyhow, so he sits me down. Now, I know this sounds bad, and we should never do this today. Was, he broke all the rules, but he sat me on his lap, which you can't do today, but he was like a grandfather. He said, Zarek, look at me. With his big blue eyes. He says, listen, anytime you need to cry, you have something going on, I want you to be able to come here. I am here for you. I'll pray with you. But he picked up a big paddle. If you misbehave... I'm going to tan you. I'm going I'm to tan you. Your parents have given me permission. Now, this is the old days, okay? And so what happened? Reverend Herb showed me love and discipline, and I shaped up like that. Now, I'm not suggesting you walk around with two-by-fours whacking people in the fanny, okay? I'm not suggesting that. But those are the old days. But you know what he represented to me? He represented to me love and discipline. And I want to let you know, I believe, that, and to this day, when I think of God, somehow Reverend Herb gets in there. And do you realize when people try to find God, they look at you, and you and I represent God to people. And you can make a difference in someone's lives. And so what you think about God, and that changed me, that, that changed me from God who wants to destroy me, who God who loves me so much that he's not going to let me fall away. 
God disciplines those he loves. And so he had a right thinking about God. So what you think about God and what you think about yourself. The two most important thoughts that you can have are these two. What you think about God, what you think about yourself. And you know what you are in God? You are a new creation, the Bible says. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. You are a new creation. And God calls you beloved. God calls you, you're my son in who I am well pleased. Why? He looks through Jesus. So if you have the right view of God and the right view of yourself, you can stand with confidence, not with cockiness. There's a vast difference. I will boast in my God. I will not boast in myself. And so I can stand up here. I can be bold, not in me, but I'm bold in God. It's a vast difference. And it's really easy, that line. It's very easy to go get cocky. But, you know, God always slaps me when I do. <laughs> you know, we did that at my wife. Anyhow, but so, yeah, yeah, she doesn't slap me. But you know what I'm saying. She'll put me in my place, which I appreciate. Hey, why are you getting upset with this for? Well, come on, is it about God or you? It's about God. All right. I, I love that. And we help each other with that. So let's move forward. Don't let the world, doctors, culture, sin, or your own insecurities define you. Let the word of God define you. Well, I'm born with this. No, you're not born with that. Yeah, you might have born with that, but you've been born again. My people perish for lack of knowledge. If you believe a lie, a lie will keep you captive. And so, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is when Jesus, this is important, Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. This is what God said. This is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Now why did God tell that to Jesus? This is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. He told him his identity, didn't he? Why? What happens right after in the wilderness? What does the enemy say? If you are the son of God, if you are a Christian, you should never have those thoughts. Thoughts do not make you sin. Action on those thoughts do. And just because you have a temptation or a propensity or a a, a type of leaning in a certain direction does not mean you have to obey its lust. Just because someone's attractive at work doesn't mean you have to cheat on your spouse. Just because something feels good doesn't mean, oh, I have his urges. So what? You have urges. What you gotta do is you have to what? He says, I am a son of God. I will not play around with this nonsense. So so this is what began to happen. So he said, you are my beloved son who I'm well pleased, and the enemy will come. Listen, if the enemy's gonna do that with Satan, will you not do it with you and I? (laughs) What kind of Christian are you? You might as well give up. Forget about it. You'll never be anything. Just settle. You're going to be in third class. You're going to be, you're going to be in, in the barrel of the plane. Not even first class or coach. You're in the luggage compartment in that plane. You're no good. You're no good. That's what the enemy will tell you. And God says, no, you are son of God. And, and, and this is the truth. You can't know who you truly are until you know who Jesus is. Let me say that again. You can't truly know who you are until you know who Jesus is. If you're looking at the notes, we're not going to go through the whole thing. The last night when I was going through this, I did feel like I needed to spend more time on the identity issues. This is what we're doing here. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Well, they say this, they say, they say I'm a prophet, and this, no, 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 Jesus, who do you say that I am? Why would Jesus ask him that? There several different reasons. But he knew something. He knew the secret of their success was to know how you think about God and how you think about yourself. And he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter, God bless him, stood up. And this is what Peter said. But you are the son of God. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He got it right. And look what Jesus has to say. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed, he blesses him, are you. Listen, when you identify who God is, you're blessed. How many want to be blessed? Identify, that's why we worship God. Right? We look to the sun. We, we worship God. You're the God of miracles. What are we doing? We're honoring. We're blessing God. And when we bless God, God blesses us back. Why? Because we are, at, we are connecting to our creator and the lover of our souls. 
Our design is being actualized because you're created to be with God and function with God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, look, watch this. What, let me show you something. When, when Peter got who Jesus was, something extraordinary happens to Peter. Watch this. And I also say to you, you are Peter. His other word was a reed flowing in the wind. Jesus changes his name. No, you are a rock, Peter. And he knew he'd betray him three times. He knew he would mess, make mistakes, but he saw the end. And God sees the end in you. Don't let your weaknesses, don't let your propensities, don't let your sexual orientation or whatever people say about you control you. You know what? Your identity is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. That's your identity. And when you identify with God and say who he is, that's why we worship God. Why do we throw our hands in the air? Because we're saying, God, this is what you are. When you say who God is, God says who you are. Who do you say he is? Why am I so passionate about this? Because this is the key to life. The two most important thoughts you can have in your life is what you think about God and what you think about yourself. But you don't never know who you are until you know Jesus. You'll never know who you are running around trying to find somebody to make you whole, trying to find that relationship, trying to find that job, trying to find that situation. You're going to be running around making and wasting your life. My friends, the answer to everything is the person of Jesus Christ. He is God, and he is your identity. Peter's a rock, but you don't know what I've been through. Yeah, I understand that, but what Jesus did on the cross is enough to change your identity. But I have these orientation, I have these feelings, I have these urges. Well, so does the rest of humanity. You don't live by your urges, you live by the word of God. You are beautiful. God loves you despite your failings. But we must know who he is. going to ask the worship team to make your way up. So who are you? Who are you? This is who you are. You are a chosen race. You're not some, uh, you're not Italian, you're not German. You know, all those things are important, I suppose. But you are beyond American citizen. You are a child of God. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You know, only the priests could go before God. No one else could. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn in two, and priesthood was open to men, women, and children. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, but you don't know my past. Well, guess what? Well, Christ is enough. A people of his own possession and God does not make junk if you are a believer in God you're beautiful if you're alive you're beautiful the potential for you to know God is here right now what are you gonna do about it and so I'm gonna have to close out here and what's your purpose okay this is your identity who you are is what a chosen race and what's your what's our purpose everybody what's our purpose we're not here just to consume stuff we're not here to be consumer index we're not here to keep up with our neighbors. We're not here to put selfies and something on Facebook to show, oh, I can do it too. Nothing wrong with those things, but people are so enamored by that. What's your purpose? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness. Are you in darkness? He's calling you out of the darkness. Why? Because the darkness will destroy you. You're not made to walk in that darkness. This darkness will destroy you. It will strip you. It will strip your children and your grandchildren. It's time to take a stand. It's time to say, I'm following Jesus. My identity is wrapped up in the man that was put on the cross, wrapped up in a grave clothes, and came again. That's who my identity is. My identity is not my past, not my family, not my culture, not my propensities, not not my orientations, quote unquote. What it is, is I am found in Jesus Christ. And so what are we going to do with that? This is the question. Will I change the world 
or will the world change me? Which one is going to be, everybody? Do we want to be just, okay, all right. Are we going to be castrated? Are we going to be a castrated church? Don't let them castrate us like they did to Daniel. And even with that, Daniel stood up. Will I change the world or will the world change me? As far as I'm concerned, with God as my help, one of our mission statements of our church is to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and what? Make a difference, to change the world through his power. Will my identity come from God or from the world? Which one, everybody? Which one? Which one? You need to make a choice. Are you going to look for the world to say who you are or look for God who say you are? And with many other words, see? It's biblical, speaking a lot of words. This is Peter speaking, preaching. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Are you saving yourself from this crooked generation? Well, that's legalism. I can't save myself. Jesus saved me. Well, that's true. Jesus did save you. But if you are on the Titanic and it hits an iceberg and you're in the frigid water and someone throws a life uh, lifesaver to you or comes at the rowboat, you got to climb on that thing. you got to save yourself by taking the opportunity available to you. Are you willing to save yourself from this culture? Are you willing to save yourself from this crooked generation? Or are we just going to go, oh, laissez-faire. Oh, I'm just going oh, to go to church. It's okay. I don't know about you, but I'm going to walk around that way. Who's in your life that will challenge you in love? Hey, what are you doing? Oh, well, it's no big deal. What do you mean? What do you are you claiming out your taxes? Oh, no. That's, that's wrong, man. Render to Caesar what Caesar, what's God is God. What are you doing? Oh, you know, I kind of like her. She's kind of cute. And, oh, you're married. I know, but nothing wrong with having a little fun. Yeah, it's wrong, bro. Listen, I love you, man. What are you doing? Someone's saying, yeah, life's not worth living, man. I just want to end. No, don't think that way. That's, that's the enemy. We look out for each other. We're a team. Don't be by yourself. Find your calling. Find your purpose. We all have a purpose. We're a royal priesthood. God's own chosen people who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's bow our heads. Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. Lord, I just feel it in my, I have this fire in my bones today, God, because this is the truth. Lord, I'm speaking your truth, God. Father, we were asking for deliverance of our minds. What we think about you determines how we look at ourselves. And Father, we want our thoughts to be right. We want to save ourselves from this crooked generation. In Jesus' name, with every head bow, I'm going to ask you a question today. How many of you would say, you know what, I, 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 I believe in God and all that, but I've never surrendered. If your heart was going to stop, if your heart stopped right now and you left this place, are you absolutely certain you'd be with God? Well, I'm a pretty good person. It doesn't cut it, folks. You and I are not good enough, and that's, that's good news. We're not good enough. But Jesus is good enough. He's more than enough. And he's reaching out to you and saying, come to me, and I will change who you are. I will change your orientation, your orientation to sin, whatever orientation that could be, your, your propensities, your shame, your past. When you declare who he is, God will name who you are. And that's the purpose of Cornerstone, right there. And the purpose of God has for you today. And you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I, I, I've fallen away and I want to start anew, or I've never done it before. I'm going to pray for you in a few moments, but before I do that, I'm going to ask you, every head bow, I'm going to ask you just, we're not going to embarrass you, put you on the spot, but we just want to give you an opportunity. Say, Pastor, you please pray for me. I, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time, or, uh, or, or, Renew my commitment. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Come on, let's be bold here. Real, real high. Let's lift that real high. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on, there's a couple more. I know there is. Thank you, thank you. So I was watching online. Okay, let's pray for that. And we're going to pray for something else as well. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these people that have acknowledged that they want to start with you in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to repeat with me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. 
I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I receive you as my Lord, the boss of my life, the lover of my life, and the forgiver of all of my sins. Thank you that I am now forgiven. I declare you are God. Now God, show me who I am in you. And I will walk with you all the days of my life with your help in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, you look up at me real quick. If you don't have a card in your worship guide, you can the pocket in front of you. It's called a connection card. We just want to help you. You can say right here, I'm committing my life to Christ. Check that one, or I'm renewing my commitment. So you can go ahead and do that. But I want to pray for the rest of us as well. Because I'm battling this too, folks. My thoughts about God and who I am is a constant struggle. And that's pretty simple, isn't it, everybody? That's pretty simple. And that's what we're called to do. Change how you think about God. Change how you think about yourself. So let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, let's lift our hands as an act of surrender. Father, we lift our hands to you, recognizing without you we can do absolutely nothing. And Father, we declare that you are God. We declare that you are not an angry God, but you are a loving God. We thank you that the fact that we're alive means you have a redemptive purpose for our lives. And Father, forgive us for thinking that you are a mean God or a bad God. No, you are a loving God. For you so loved the world that you gave. And you did not come to destroy the world. You come to save the world. And Father, we thank you that you love us. And we, just, we, we receive it in Jesus' name. We, we, we give you our pain. We give you our shame. We give you the, the wrong ideas we have of you. Thank you that you are a loving, compassionate God. We receive you today in Jesus' name afresh. Now, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would show us who we are to you. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to ask God to speak to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll do it. I want you to ask God, God, what do you think of me? And listen to his voice. I'm going to do it right now. Give me a moment. In Jesus' name, I command every dark spirit in this place to go in the name of Jesus. All self-condemnation gone in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd, you'd rise up. I pray you'd speak to everyone here. And Father, I pray you would tell them what you think of them right now in Jesus' name. So I want you right now, I want you right now to ask the question, God, what do you think of me? Go ahead, ask him quietly in your own heart. What is he saying? What's he saying to you right now? What's he saying to you? You know what he's saying? He's saying, I love you. You have a purpose. Your life is full. Until the day I call you home, I have something for you. I love you, and I have good plans for you both now and the future. Thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Let's thank God this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's all stand if we could. We want to worship God through our... Oh, before we do that, we want to worship God through our offerings. Thank you, Rick, for showing me that. I almost forgot. See, it's not all about money. It's about worship, though. Worship is awesome. And so, Father, we pray you bless this offering today in Jesus' name, that you'd multiply it, that you'd bless the giver. Father, we thank you. It's a test. We, we, we trust you with everything that we've given you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, ushers, do that. And as we're doing that, everybody, you want to find your purpose, come back at 1230 today, uh, Grove Track. We're having Grove Track is find your purpose. Find your test. It will test you, help you to find what you're good at in the context of an environment of a church. Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and do that. Let's conclude with the last song as we do that. I'm going to ask their, the prayer team to make their way up.
everybody. If you want prayer, our altars are open.